thank you all for joining. And uh, this is our last presentation before the snow falls uh, for the evening, and we get our first measurable snowfall. So hopefully everyone's looking forward to the shoveling that will begin from here forward. Um, I thought we'd take some time today to uh, to discuss Office 365. Um, as you can imagine, this is a exhaustingly large topic. Um, and so what we're going to try and do is break things down. Uh, as we've kind of tried to do throughout the series, uh, we've tried very hard to um, differentiate you know, where some of these features and functions are coming from and where can you find value. And we're focused very hard in the Enterprise Mobility Suite uh, a few weeks ago on the top half of this agenda here. Um, everything in the, you know, uh, really in the top eight circles there. And what we're going to do today, um, and we had discussed Windows 10 uh, two weeks ago uh, as part of the modern workplace, and now today we're going to focus specifically on the stuff in the box right there. And even the stuff in the box is pretty daunting, right? This is, you know, not everybody owns, um, if you'll notice on the left-hand side, not everybody owns Office 365 um, E5, right, the top version. Uh, some people just own Office 365 E3, um, and some might even own E1 uh, plans. But So I thought it would be helpful for us to kind of even break this into three chunks, and that is we're just going to first look at some of the features and functionalities, just catch people up on what's available for us to do, and we're going to kind of do this broad brush pretty quickly, just uh, hit the highlights of you know what's in an, an E3, E365 plan, an Office 365 plan. Then we're going to kind of focus in on security. Um, it's been a very uh, important topic. How do people you know, get things locked down? Um, how do they manage this new world um, and, and things of that nature, especially within the uh, E3 plan that's available? And last but not least, we'll focus on... Um, on the E5 features and you know what are you missing out if you only have E3 um, both from a security perspective and then we'll touch a little bit on functionality there for the Skype and Teams extensions. So hopefully that agenda meets with you. We're going to kind of build from the bottom up and um, really for this first part I'm willing to you know we're going to demo as much as we can. I've got some PowerPoints and we're going to whiteboard. Uh, so we're going to use all three methods I think to just try and communicate quickly. Um, this first section where we're showing features I thought you know I really don't have a lot of slides for it so let's just kind of dive in. Um, I also want to kind of ground you uh, with this slide right here. Some of the security topics we're going to talk about are uh, we can talk about relative to a cybersecurity framework that's out there. Uh, many of you may uh, subscribe to this uh, in terms of discussions, but again, security is a large topic also, and it's important to know that you know there's five general buckets where the controls will fit into. Either you're trying to identify uh, the appropriate data to put controls around, you're trying to protect that data, which is what everyone Usually when they think of security, that's what they think of is protect, protect, protect. Um, but ultimately, um, it's also important that you have uh, detection mechanisms to make you aware of problems that are occurring in your environment, that you have response procedures to take care of those problems. And in some situations, such as eh, even things like ransomware, um, you have to simply recover, right? That is your uh, your response is to re simply recover from um, having keys locked, uh, potentially things of that nature. So we'll try to talk about things in context, uh, if possible, throughout this presentation too. All right. So 365 functionalities and features. Um, again, we're focused right here on the bottom area, um, and just kind of as a quick, you know, maybe 10 minute walkthrough. Let's just take a look at everything that's in 365 and that we could be expecting to get out of here. And again, know that uh, you know there's no way within even a 60-minute time frame you could cover all the features, but let's just give it a broad brush effort. Um, so with this said, let's take a look and just kind of left to right, work them down. Um, and I'll kind of pull out of PowerPoint here and just go to, so Office Pro Plus as an example. Your Pro Plus, um, you have the ability to install Office. Um, this is with the E3 plans and higher. You have the ability to install Office and um, use a version called Office Pro Plus. Office Pro Plus is, and I'll just kind of show you on ours here, Office Pro Plus is, it's like uh, Office 2016, if you would think of it that way, except since Office 2016 has come out, I believe there's been about 90 updates to Office. 
since then. So it's a locally installed version of Office. It includes all the typical products that you're accustomed to, Skype client, uh, Excel, you know, PowerPoint, OneNote, Word, um, and so forth. And the licensing is simply attributed with your uh, through your cloud subscription. So that's why it belongs to Bruce.Ward. And with this uh, Pro Plus, you're entitled to uh, basically 15 installations of Office. Um, this is on pretty much any machine that you're going to use. So that includes your corporate device. Uh, as we all know, uh, most employees nowadays have two and a half, three devices that they're leveraging. So your tablets, your phone, your home machine, all of these can have a proper installation of Office. And you can make separate decisions. Um, regarding how those updates are occur. You can see here mine are automatically downloaded and installed. Uh, but similarly, you could put those out through your WSUS server and typical patch patterns as you're accustomed to. Um, you also can uh, determine uh, what channel you're in, and, and this is you know some of the techie design of the hood, but how often are you going to get these updates and uh, feature upgrades? Um, and uh, how often are those going to be pushed? Is there a, a change management process that you have in place to get this office out there? So I'm just kind of showing you that uh, Office Pro Plus is, uh, you know, it's really the same product that you're accustomed to, but much richer. Uh, one thing I'd kind of point out is uh, in the upper left-hand corner, this just came out in the last, I don't, I'm going to say 30, 60 days, this autosave uh, button. Um, that's, again, an example of features that are being um, discovered and uh, pushed out to cloud versions or Office Pro Plus quicker than, um, let's say, Office 2016, which might have to wait for Service Pack 1 or Service Pack 2 before getting features like this. So the security and the features come along much faster in the Pro Plus version. So kind of wanted to just highlight that. Um, obviously, you're getting Exchange, right? A full mailbox. Um, we'll cover the eDiscovery and uh, DLP, but if you were to manage uh, your exchange, you're getting the capabilities to, under an administrative council here, what we're looking at is uh, administration of Office 365. And you getting a full full exchange server, if you want to think of it that way, in the cloud. Um, and really, it's, it's done as a service. Um, you've got uh, your own administrative uh, council for it. Oops, it's listed right here. And you can see, I would simply click on that. Up here is the Exchange Council. So all of the services here can be individually managed. Um, and Exchange is no different. So uh, when you're in Exchange or Skype, uh, in terms of the Management Council, you're really seeing the same thing you would see in an on-prem server. Um, you've got capabilities to you know, evaluate your users, quotas, things of that nature. But the one thing you don't see are things like uh, disk requirements or storage. Um, you don't have to set up high availability or disaster recovery, right? All of this kind of comes uh, pre-built into the service. Um, but you otherwise have the same exchange, uh, exchange admin center that you would have for typical. Um, users are going to enjoy uh, 135 gig mailboxes. Uh, that's the default. And uh, in fact, with the E3 plan, you actually can have infinite mailboxes uh, through something called personal archives. But um, retention folders. So the advantage, I think, uh, from a functionality perspective is mostly around uh, the lack of need for high availability disaster recovery. In fact, uh, I'm kind of segueing here a little bit, but if you're, uh, if you're having difficulty judge, uh, justifying Office 365 or kind of want to know where you're going to get some value, we've worked with customers in the past, and again, this is a little segue here, on where they can find value. And I've uh, assembled a spreadsheet that we've uh, used to kind of have conversations with customers about hey, okay, what, what value am I getting from Office Pro Plus, right? And you might get some value from IT being out of the office upgrade business or standardization. Exchange is much more meaningful, right? You no longer have to worry about, you know, having a disaster recovery uh, service because um, it's built into the service itself. You get to offload some of the storage and so forth. And so obviously based on, you know, how much, uh, how many, how big your environment is, and how many employees, you know, we can make some estimates as to what this is, but only you could really know the real cost. And so we work with you to at least have a dialogue in that regard. So if you're focused on value, uh, there certainly is ways to uh, discuss and get to the value 
of the actual products themselves uh, in pretty quick fashion. All right, so dancing around a little bit here, Skype and Teams is also included. Um, starting with Skype, let me just kind of show you what Skype can look like, and I'll kind of get this minimized on the desktop here. Skype can be, uh, you know, just uh, evaluating real-time presence of people in your organization. So uh, I can see that Sue is available and is on a video-capable device, away, offline, and so forth. So you can find people based on groups. You also can find uh, people within your organization as well as outside. So we could um, look at people outside uh, that might have availability, that I might uh, have frequent conversations with, things of that nature. So in addition to presence, um, which is the real-time status for them, you also have the capabilities to IM. So I could Adam Gaz and Smith, and I could say hello, right? and things of that nature. And you simply can have an IM conversation. These can be escalated um, and moving on. So um, These can be escalated to voice calls, um, Skype calls, so from my device to his device, independent of where they're at or whether it's a iPad that he's on in Hawaii and I'm on a PC or a Mac here at corporate, it doesn't matter. We're going to have an audio conversation over our Skype clients independent of the phone system. So um, that's another nice capability. There's obviously capabilities to share video. Um, we can also share screens, which in fact is what we're doing today. So Skype is a great feature. It's been around for a long time. Uh, you also have the capabilities to interact with um, the public Skype, or what I'd call the consumer version of Skype. So if I looked up my personal address here, Bruce Ward 27, I could look and see that in the Skype directory, and it indeed would find me and I could have a conversation then with my Skype for Business over to Skype Consumer. Uh, hopefully that's making sense to you, but there's 300 million people that leverage Skype today, and Skype for Business has a way to interface and kind of keep those conversations together, yet give you a directory and the ability to manage all that information from one client. So nice features there uh, within the Skype. Uh, Skype is kind of giving way uh, to Teams. And I've got an example of Teams, I believe, uh, using my demo tenant here. Um, let's go over to the Teams client, uh, which I think is right here. The Teams client um, is the graduate as to where Skype is going. Um, Microsoft has aggregated a lot of the uh, your Outlook, your uh, so Outlook messaging, Skype messaging, OneDrive, SharePoint. Yammer, a lot of these solutions, rather than being five different applications or browsers that you need to go into, Microsoft's aggregated all of this into the Teams client. So Microsoft's um, wanting you to, to leverage Teams, and we've found great use cases for Teams. Um, from a Skype perspective, it's different, right? It, it, but it has the Skype features within it. So you'll see chat features here within it. Um, you'll see capabilities to, uh, and you can have private conversations just like I did in the Skype client. You can have teams and aggravating information. So uh, an engineering team, as an example, may have some conversations that are going on as a team and also have maybe some files that they leverage as a team. Uh, that's not a very exciting example. I guess uh, research and development might be a better one. But you can see uh, previous conversations that you had as a team, files. You can even uh, plug in other Microsoft uh, products, which we weren't even uh, tending to go into, but other parts of Office 365, such as Planner, which is effectively uh, it's a light project management um, portal for assigning tasks and keeping track of uh, where things are at. So again, just trying to give you a high level for where Teams is at. This client I'm, I'm happen to be accessing in a web browser right now. Um, Fortunately, they also have a, uh, a downloadable, uh, kind of a richer interface, but it looks exactly the same as this. And then they also have a mobile client uh, with the uh, same power and features. So if you're looking for the future and kind of looking for what uh, Microsoft is saying is their high collaboration area, Teams uh, can certainly uh, be a great location for that. And, you know, just in the interest of time, let's look at a couple others. So Office Online, um, I guess I would like to cover that, uh, as well as OneDrive, the next two. Office Online, uh, let's go to a OneDrive. 
So OneDrive, uh, here I am in a browser, and again, you can access all of these uh, under the uh, what they call the app launcher in the left-hand side and see all the applications available to you. But here I'm in the OneDrive uh, in my browser version of it, and I've got some files that are uploaded in there, Excel files and uh, PowerPoint files and so forth. And what you're getting with the online version of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote is you're getting the capabilities to open these files without necessarily um, needing the application installed. So if you'll look quickly at, let's say, this Cloud Strategy workbook, you'll notice it sells Excel online. And you'll notice I stayed within a browser for this. So what's happening here is we're looking at Excel. We've got the capabilities to uh, even open it in the Excel application if we'd like. But right now we're staying in a browser. It's a faster version of Excel. Uh, it has, you know, I'll call it 60, 70, 80 percent of the features of full Excel. Um, but you're not going to be able to do, you know, extensive pivot tables and or have all the functions of Excel. But this is great for machines that maybe don't have Excel installed or you just have a need to kind of quickly look at something. The browser uh, version could be a great uh, version to do that. So again, all these online versions of uh, Office come with the Office 365 package. OneDrive, kind of as I was showing right there, uh, in addition to being a number of files, let me kind of close out of that, in addition to being a number of files, working with files in a browser is you know, something that you might do when you're remote, but oftentimes people like to work with their files locally on their machine. Fortunately, the OneDrive client uh, is, comes installed on machines, and you can see we'll process files and bring, the, bring a copy of them down locally. So I work pretty extensively with our OneDrive files uh, and files that are here within the, um, in the items. So you might go in here and go to, uh, you know, uh, actually this presentation is being stored under Office 365 webinar. This is the webinar that we're using, and here's another uh, item. And the little green checkbox means that this is a synchronized copy of what's available up in the cloud. So again, put the files where you need to, let OneDrive do the synchronization, um, know that you have one terabyte of storage in total for Office 365. So that's kind of a quick uh, overview of uh, some of the things I guess I could show. There's obviously some really neat things that, you know, at some point have um, more granular uh, adoption by customers. You know, you'll find your use case for my analytics. What is that? Or planner, how do I use it? I think I showed it a little bit. Stream, Flow, Staff Hub, Delve, Yammer, Video. Those are all great aspects. And again, we could spend the next 20, 30 minutes covering each of the features and functions for them, and that wouldn't leave us any time for what I think is a, another priority topic, which is security. So as we kind of dive into security, I think it's worthwhile to kind of go back to Exchange, which is a very, um, I'm going to say 70 to 80 percent of our customers that have purchased Office 365 did so for the purpose of Exchange and Office. So uh, if those are the primary drivers and those are where our customers are sitting, I want to certainly cover eDiscovery and DLP, which I guess I'd consider security features. Um, so let's cover those as items of that. E-discovery. Uh, I won't do e-discovery justice again. We could have a longer conversation about this. But what I think is important to know is that your data that is held within either Exchange or OneDrive or SharePoint or Skype, so any of your Office 365 data, including Teams, Planner, all of this data can be preserved. Okay? And it can be preserved with retention policies. We can simply set up a policy that says, I want to keep all, all the data for all my users for two years. Or I want to keep all data for all users forever. Retention policies are flexible as to how you retain them. You also have deletion policies if you want to get rid of stuff after a year. Um, again, this is outside of what the users might do from a management perspective. So if you've got a policy set up to keep everything forever and a user deletes items, they're still there. It's just that the user no longer sees them. So preservation keeps an immutable copy of that data so that you can come along uh, as a compliance officer um, or in litigation and be able to use these, um, use this data and know that you have an immutable database. 
Um, there's a SharePoint portal that's already built for you for doing the search and identifying the data. Um, there's some tools for analyzing that data and basically getting a preview of that data and making sure it's proper. And uh, in some cases, you can uh, you know, uh, export that data uh, for external review or grant someone externally access into the portal with limited rights for them to look at that. So external counsel doesn't necessarily have to be dealing with data shipping all the time. We can leave the data where it's at and let people uh, look at the data from that perspective. So a fair amount uh, of capability within the e-discovery. This is a very exciting area for people that have the E3 plan because uh, all of these features are included um, as part of that plan. Equally important is something called data, data loss prevention. From a security perspective, you can imagine it is not wise to be sending highly sensitive information out through email. Sure, it's easy to do, but that's exactly why uh, it needs protection. Uh, things like credit card numbers, uh, client information, um, social security numbers, things like that should be evaluated in email, and that's exactly what this portion is doing. You're generally creating some logical rules as, as to message transport, or in OneDrive and SharePoint's case, it's message that's stored. And then you have certain rules as to what you want to do with that data if it's found. So data loss prevention is a very strong capability for you to take your IT cycles that you used to spend on keeping the lights on, if you will, with regards to exchange, and instead focused on the security aspects, encrypting information as it goes out because it contains credit card information, notifying compliance officers, blocking the data from going, notifying the end user that they're about to violate policy, asking them if they would like to override things. These are all options that are available through a very strong DLP offering available in Office 365. All right, we'll skip the build on that. Another uh, kind of ancillary area, but uh, kind of important because we have uh, a number of customers that have been showing interest on this. We also have a webinar on this in a week uh, if you're interested in learning more. But Power Apps is a capability our customers are just uh, uncovering. And it's for taking uh, basically line of business data and systems. And if you have a need to interface with that data, Maybe easier than, let's say, today you export things into a spreadsheet and you're working specifically with that spreadsheet, updating it, and kind of wondering how that data can get back into your database. Power Apps might be a great solution for you. The example I give here is we have a, um, we have a customer of ours that operates greenhouses. And uh, back on the, uh, in the end, they'd like to know how the plants are doing, right? And um, things like, uh, how is the soil? Should they be watered? Um, you know, what's our capacity? What's our, when's our inventory going to be filled with the stuff that we're growing? Like, is it almost ready to harvest? Things of that nature. So you have people out in the field that are actually grabbing some of that diagnostic data about soil moisture content, chemical content, light, um, growth, harvest time, estimates, uh, things of that nature. And doing so with a spreadsheet would be painful. So what we've done is we've built a Power App to allow them to do this on their favorite mobile device or on a tablet and enter this data in in a much easier, you know, touch-friendly format, which then filters back into the SQL database. So again, Power Apps are included uh, as part of Office 365 and certainly as a strong way for you to input data into your back-end systems. Okay. So with that, let's uh, jump on over back to the agenda and know that we kind of covered at least the basics of what's in Office 365. And now it's time for us to zip into some security level elements. Stick with me on this one because Azure AD Basic um, is a big item, right? Uh, we covered it more extensively and some of its features under EMS because um, Azure AD Plan 1 and Plan 2 are basically the, the granddaddies, if you will, of Azure AD Basic. But it's surprising to a lot of Office 365 customers what they own within Office 365 with Azure AD Basic. So let's dive into that. Azure AD Basic, as well as the next features I'm going to talk about, are really related to identifying data and or users 
and protecting that. And so let's uh, let's look further at that. Azure AD uh, can do a lot of things, and the basic version includes some basic capabilities that I'm going to circle. That's one feature I'd like to talk about: single sign-on to SaaS-based applications. I'd also like to talk about multi-factor authentication. Okay. These are kind of strong areas. Um, the access panel is how users are going to get to these single sign-on applications. We'll kind of show this and, and dive in deep in just a second. The app launcher, I've kind of just shown you a little bit uh, through demo, but um, certainly that's where uh, another area where these applications are going to surface. Let's focus on those four areas, knowing that the uh, Azure AD Plan 1 and the stuff that we covered um, is going to be covered under things like conditional access. But Azure AD Basic includes at least the things in the circles to get you started. So let's take a look at those. So if this was a feature that you wanted, right, I want to provide my employees access to every application that's, you know, that they need out in the cloud kind of day one. Right? Let's say you have a new employee starting and they don't know what applications you use, but boy, you use, uh, you know, uh, you use Concur for expense management, and you use uh, you know, Workplace for some HR functions, and, and so on and so forth. These applications can be provided using one identity, right? the same identity that they use for Office 365 today. In fact, this process, Microsoft Azure Active Directory, is what's used for Office 365 today. It's how you get your mail. Okay? It's how you use PowerPoint. Um, it's how your office was registered um, for Windows and so forth. So you're using it already. And you may not have known, but you can extend this to thousands of applications that are available out there and provide single sign-on to these applications. I give you this, you know, call it the NASCAR slide, if you will, of some applications, but there are 3,500 plus applications that you could provide to your users, and all the work has been pre-integrated for you already. You simply need to add them in, determine which users need to single sign-on to it, and so forth. This is available in your Office 365 Azure AD Basic today. If I go back a slide, you may want to encompass multi-factor authentication for some of those applications. Some of it may have sensitive data. <gasps> That's HR data or payroll data or maybe certain administrators of that data need to have MFA, but not everybody. What you get with Office 365 and MFA, I'll try to distinguish uh, between uh, a couple weeks ago when we did the, um, when we did the screen to the agenda slide. Azure AD Basic does include MFA, as you'll kind of see here. Okay. And the MFA that's included is basic, meaning it's on or it's off. And that's what you get with Office with Azure AD Basic. You don't get conditional MFA, which is available in Plan 1. And that's probably the biggest distinction we see nowadays. Okay, so, you know, can I have a good experience with Azure AD Basic MFA? Absolutely. So um, I'll try to distinguish the two um, in, in brief context here with the following slide. So if you turn on MFA for a user today with Azure AD Basic, MFA is on all of the time, meaning an application... Um, uh, you don't get the distinct, you don't get the privilege of turning MFA off in certain instances. So if you've got an employee who's sitting at his corporate office on your corporate LAN behind your corporate firewall, and he's accessing, he or she is accessing Outlook or SharePoint, they're going to get MFA prompt, or they're going to have uh, something called an application. If the application doesn't support uh, modern authentication, which is a term used, then they would need something called an app password. But either way, there is uh, some configuration and setup to get that working and have a, a great experience. 
that didn't differentiate that user sitting in the corporate from maybe a home user who was accessing a sensitive application after hours from home on their iPad. So the inability to differentiate is where conditional access MFA really steps in. And without drilling into too much labor, because again, this is not uh, part of Office 365 Azure AD Basic, but part of the elevated plan, you can leverage these conditions, such as certain users or certain devices or locations or apps, as well as looking at things like, hey, um, that session seems to be going on at a weird time of day, or um, if you're an iPad and you're you know, not healthy, I want to have a different process for you than a healthy iPad. Um, if you're, and then also what you can do based on those conditions, such as the controls allowed here, might mean, yes, MFA is required, but in some cases you might even deny access or allow limited access. So a lot more flexibility with regards to how MFA is applied is available under Plan 1. That said, I just want to get back to the point that MFA is available in Office 365. It's a non-differentiated MFA, and you can have a great experience. And we're happy to walk you through uh, some of those capabilities kind of offline. You also can tie uh, their, uh, this product in with the uh, with third-party MFA products. If uh, but you get Azure AD MFA as part of uh, Plan One. Okay, so that was kind of a brief, you know, there's a lot of things, again, that Azure AD can do. Uh, kind of just go back, slide. Azure AD can do a heck of a lot. We covered just a few things that are uh, available there. After you've provided and set up the applications uh, in the single sign-on, then they're available in the access panel and in the app launcher. All right. Um, and next on our agenda was to discuss... Um, some detection and response capabilities that are available uh, within um, Office 365. So um, kind of back on our agenda slide, and I'll keep that. Back on our agenda slide, you'll notice that um, we were talking about uh, logs, right, and uh, activity logs. And so one of the areas that's important for you to know about is that these activity logs that are here are not turned on by default. Uh, Microsoft just made a, uh, a setting change that if you were to spin up a new tenant today, they would be there. But activity logs are nothing but, let me show you what they are rather than PowerPoint this one. We'll go into the uh, security and compliance portal. So I'll go over here and zip on down to security and compliance. Open that in a new tab. In the security and compliance portal, um, if you have this turned on, uh, which uh, is now on the front, it would be right here on this screen. It would say, hey, your logs are not turned on. Would you like to turn them on? And you can click the button and off they go, right? It's not a complicated uh, procedure to get uh, logging going. You do have to wait 24, 48 hours before logs get generated. But when you're doing a search and investigation, all the audit logs for all the activities for all the users are recorded. Okay, recorded meaning everything is logged. And what types of activities might get logged? Well, let's take a look at what types of activities. If you accessed a file, checked out a file, discarded a file, recycled a file, and these are just the file activities. But wait, there's more. We could go down to email. Let's just go down to here. Here's email. If you create an email, if you purge an email, if you move an email, hopefully you're getting the sense that if you do anything, it's logged. Okay? This can be extremely helpful because you as a compliance manager might have a situation or might want to know some information um, where you need to go search for a user like admin or Joe or whatever, and you could go look for a particular user and their activities between a date and another date. You know, again, filter this as you wish, but imagine all the logs getting created around all the activities. It's sometimes very helpful to know those logs. It's also sometimes helpful 
to take actions based on those logs. What if someone is sharing accidentally a very important uh, uh, share in OneDrive or in SharePoint to external parties? Okay, how would you know about that, right? So logging is one way to know who made the oops or who's had got nefarious activities going on. So all of these logs are documented. They need to be turned on. And um, this is included as part of your Office 365. Additionally, you can set up things like alerts okay, manually. Um, you could uh, verify or determine a few things that are logical to alert on. Hey, I'd like to know when someone's added as into a administrator or global admin group or um, when someone shares my data outside the organization, please alert me. Those sorts of things can all be uh, alerted on. No alerts are set up by default. Okay, so um, just know that that's logging is kind of step one. Setting up alerting manually is, is something we've seen customers do, but ultimately there's a lot of data there, and um, oftentimes uh, we'll talk about an additional capability Microsoft has to surface that important data. All right, um, so those were the activity logs, and then MDM. I think I am going to go to back to the PowerPoint for this just because... Uh, Kind of, it's easier to show this than to demo. So here's the logs page. Uh, there wasn't much to show. You guys kind of know all this at this point. Um, better than ActiveSync. Most organizations we've seen are just leveraging ActiveSync, meaning just they let any user uh, with a proper credentials log in and get their mail, and that's ActiveSync. What you get with Office 365 is something called MDM for Office, 3, uh, for Office 365. It's included. And rather than reading the chart of the, three, uh, the five things that are available there, I'm going to summarize them for you. Number one, gets you selective wipe. If you put an application on the device, you get to take it off. So when you erase Johnny's, um, when Johnny is no longer an employee, you can pull back his mail and his OneDrive and his Skype and his Word and Excel and PowerPoint without deleting the photos that he has on his device. Um, the device wipe that you get with ActiveSync is a full device wipe, and most organizations are not doing it. Therefore, your data is usually going with the device as your employee rides off into the sunset. If you want to get selective wipe back, you have that capability within Office 365. A second capability is that's above and beyond uh, uh, ActiveSync. You have the ability to evaluate the health of the device prior to allowing it data. So your Exchange data and SharePoint data can only be consumed on devices that you might deem healthy, non-rooted, uh, as an example. A third capability, and I don't see this leveraged a ton because uh, a lot of devices today are BYOD, and it would seem weird other than maybe uh, uh, pins uh, or disabling uh, external storage and, and so forth on mobile devices. Those are the types of policies you put in place, but not many users are going to sign up to get uh, mail if you're going to disable the camera or you're going to uh, require, you know, 25-digit pins and so forth. So just because you can doesn't mean you uh, you will, but um, the MDM for Office 365 includes about a thousand policies for you to enact on any of the devices that you see there. So that's uh, above and beyond uh, what you get with uh, you know typical. Uh, it's, it's something you get with Office 365. Um, another thing you get, uh, and this was kind of the last security feature in the E3, although you know it seems like we could uh, discuss these for more time, is rights management services. Rights management services has been around for quite a long time. Um, it always was an on-prem product, and when Microsoft moved the services up into Azure and made them available as part of 365, a lot more customers started adopting it. And rights management services is the enforcement element of Microsoft's Azure Information Protection series. 
So uh, I'll show you back on the agenda kind of where this fits in. But rights management services effectively allows us to protect data that's at rest by putting security around the data itself, whether it's a Word file, Excel, a PDF, an image. That data can be encrypted at rest or in transit on a PC, on a Mac, on a mobile device. Independent of any other controls you might have, this puts control right at the data level. Some examples of that. Let me just kind of pull out into uh, Outlook as an example. Let's create a new email. How might people apply rights management services? Well, if I was to write this email and assign some permissions, these are some rights management templates that can be leveraged. The encryption of email. Okay. Imagine, if you will, a user that knowingly is going to send some customer information through email. You certainly would want to use the encrypt capabilities and that encrypt template. We also have devised for our customers a button. If, uh, if you find it too cumbersome to even, uh, you know, these two, three clicks to get here, we've actually got a button on the front screen. Instead of send, we've got send encrypted. That, uh, some regulated organizations of ours have, uh, have leveraged those buttons. Do not forward or confidential. Those could be templates where, hey, we're going to stamp this as confidential, which means um, the data itself is going to have a watermark on it. Uh, a compliance officer is going to be notified that confidential data went out through email. Um, you know, there, you can have whatever uh, strength you'd like applied to the template, and those templates can be applied either manually, as we're doing here, or they can be applied as part of a transport rule. Remember that data loss prevention we looked at earlier? It was scrutinizing emails. Well, what if it scrutinized an email that had a Peters and Associates confidential on it? It would basically probably also apply encrypt only. It might also, uh, it could block it. Um, there's a number of things that DLP could pick up and then do from, uh, from that perspective. So this is an example of it. You also can surface these. Uh, rights management templates through the document itself, which is under the protect presentation and restrict access. Okay, so some of these same templates can be available to documents or data through the office applications also. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense there. Rights management templates are a, uh, uh, you know, a crawl, walk, run scenario where you kind of get oriented to it. Uh, but there are certainly some great use cases, even if it's subsets of data within your environment, maybe your HR data, um, there's been a request and so forth. Keep in mind that this is all part, uh, and I guess I wanted to show you this and remind you that rights management services are the, the beginning and they're the enforcement arm for content in Office. As soon as you get to third-party documents like PDFs, uh, as soon as you have a desire to make it easy for people to apply data classifications, you're then talking about their Azure information protection plans. And if you want to do things automatically, um, you can use plan two. But I at least wanted to kind of get you started. You have, you have the get started stuff uh, available in 365 today. All right. So we're going to keep that. And let's go to the last part of the agenda. And that will be, hold on while my machine catches up to me here. You may not own this stuff today. You may be highly interested in this stuff. Uh, specifically, ATP that I'm about to mention is probably the number one technology I could recommend to you for some problems that are occurring today known as business email compromise. It doesn't solve the problem completely, but from a technology perspective, I don't think you can do much better, especially at the price point uh, that ATP individually is coming at, or if you happen to be lucky enough to, uh, to be uh, owners of e, uh, E5, or if you looked at other elements of E5, you might be convinced of the value. 
ATP, uh, what does it do? So it does uh, anti-malware and um, in using safe links and safe attachments. Well, what does that mean? Everybody in off, part of Office 365 has Exchange Online Protection. That already evaluates all your email for incoming and outgoing viruses or spam. Takes care of it. Does a very good job. Certainly there's some best practices that could be applied to tweak that. ATP looks at stuff that doesn't have a known signature yet. So when email is coming into Office 365 and gets cleaned by Office 365 Exchange Online Protection, there's some stuff that it doesn't know about. If you're an ATP owner, it takes those attachments and blows them up in a detonation chamber, looks at what they're doing, analyzes it, and says, you know what, this is safe or not safe, and passes it on to your users. This is great for zero-day malware. Today, Microsoft is blowing up and finding one million pieces of malware per day. Okay. Stuff that does not have known signatures. Therefore, the chance that you're getting some malware in zero day is probably pretty high. Secondly, safe attachments. A lot of emails today have links to them. Those links are what can get users into trouble. Wouldn't it be nice if you could scrutinize those links and say, is that pointing at a site that really is a real site, or has that been known to have problems in the past? And indeed, Microsoft's Safe Links is doing just that. It's evaluating the links that are in the email and saying those are problematic or not, and passing them on if they're not a problem. And if that's all it did, that would be great. But additionally, about six or eight months ago, Microsoft added in anti-phishing capability. An anti-phishing capability, without getting into a ton of details, is stopping users from being impersonated through algorithms looking at who they know. So if you're employee Joe, and you've never met Sally, but Sally's sending you an email, it's going to scrutinize that conversation higher. It's going to scrutinize those links and those attachments more, block it, or prevent it even from coming in through to begin. We have some examples where uh, um, organizations have been have had their domains impersonated. So Acme might have um, instead of E, it's ACM5. Dot com, right? Things like that where people are spinning up brand new domains in order to send out emails that look like them. Okay, that's domain impersonation. So this technology is excellent at stopping user and domain impersonation, which are two major types of phishing. And phishing is one of those uh, areas uh, that's leading to um, business email compromises. We've seen uh, organizations losing hundreds of thousands of dollars on email uh, impersonations that have been uh, business email compromise for which we've had many webinars and, and, and talk extensively about. So that's the AP, ATP technology. An additional technology without going back to the agenda was on eDiscovery. I know we already talked about eDiscovery as a whole. In the E5, you get advanced eDiscovery. Advanced eDiscovery adds one component in. This process for eDiscovery is pretty much a normal process. You preserve data, you review the data, you output the data. In the analysis phase, you're getting an additional tool. Advanced eDiscovery, uh, formerly known as Akivio, can look at data and start to say, Rather than you trying to find uh, exact query of what that data is, you can do what's called near results. So if you were to look at Enron and all the data involved in the Enron, uh, all of that data actually was uploaded. If you were to look at near duplicates and email threads, you can eliminate a lot of data and a lot of legal time evaluating that data by simply informing the system what it is you're really looking for. 
yes, I'm looking for this, no, I'm not looking for that. It then takes your analysis behaviors and says, oh, okay, that's the stuff you're really looking for. I'll find you that stuff, and I can narrow it down for you with near, uh, with, uh, near duplicates and uh, extra emails. So I don't want to get into too much detail, but if you're uh, spending some time on eDiscovery and have some needs in that department, we certainly can educate you farther at what uh, advanced eDiscovery capabilities can bring to the table. All right, um, the last elements, and these are kind of just for 365 as a whole. I want to make sure at least you walk away with the idea that there are security tools for looking at your 365 security posture as a whole. Microsoft's effectively developed a scanner that's available. If uh, Let me uh, bust out of the PowerPoint. I'll go back to my demo, and I think right here at the home, for your security and compliance. You would see Michael Ira. There it is, Microsoft Secure Score. Okay, and the Microsoft Secure Score right now, my score for this tenant is 174 out of 571. It's pretty bad, right? Not doing very well. well. Let's go take a look at it. Here's the dashboard that would get created for you, and this is again specific to your specific tenant. Okay, my goal they're saying is 532. I'm at 174. What am I not doing? Oh, I haven't enabled MFA. Well, good. Bruce told me about that. I haven't enabled audio data recording. Why not? All right, that was easy. All I have to do is click a button. So there's a number of items, and they get described here in detail as to what to do, why to do it, with the goal of possibly increasing your score. Now, we take this uh, secure score with a grain of salt. It is a tool after all, and uh, sometimes it doesn't rank well. The uh, Sometimes you make a change and it doesn't record back, so I'm not banging on the tool nearly as much as just realize it's one way to evaluate your security posture, and certainly I think a helpful way. The other tool, uh, um, if you're looking at those logs and have concerns about what's going on in your Office 365, especially around email, we have a service uh, for doing this called the Office 365 Security Check, which is looking at foreign logins. It's looking for um, suspicious emails. It's looking for uh, things of those natures. We also have the capability to ingest a number of logs from on-prem as well as cloud systems into a system we run called Alarm, which looks for nefarious activities going on in all the logs and saying, you know what, I can't, I don't have the man cycles to go look at my wireless access, my Active Directory, my Azure Active Directory, my email system, um, my backup to find out what's going on. Can you aggregate all the logs and tell me Give me one pane of glass to do that. We do have that capability, and we uh, have manpower to staff to uh, to digest and uh, make sense of all those logs. I also would make you notified about uh, something called the compliance uh, area, or what's called service trust. Um, I won't do a heavy demo of this, but service trust dashboard uh, is right. Eh, it's one of these. Here it is. Service Trust Dashboard is a series of controls around certain compliance standards that you might be chartered to meet. Microsoft runs these. Uh, Microsoft runs these dashboards. It looks like I've already been signed out. So they look like this. They're relative to standards you might care about, such as GDPR or NIST. 800-53 or 800-171. So if you have a particular compliance standard, you can plug it in, and you can see that Microsoft Service is helping you out by fulfilling a lot of the controls, but there's still certain uh, things that you need to do as part of a shared responsibility model. In wrap, um, we have some uh, free offers that are available to you if you're concerned about phishing within your uh, email system, we have a free phishing uh, test trial where we'll send an email in to your users at your request uh, with a phishing concern and see who clicks. 
We're usually getting 20-25% hit rates on our phishing emails. Um, this is a, a, a third-party service that we run and manage. We also have the uh, Office 365 uh, security audit um, that we're offering as a free trial to do a one-time assessment of your Office 365 environment. Tell you if uh, you're subject to business email compromise or other items going on. We're happy to take a meeting at any time. You name the place, we'll, uh, we'll take you out and have a discussion about security. And last but not least, if you have concerns or desires to put multi-factor authentication in, we do have a turnkey multi-factor that kind of helps you dispel between you know that conditional access that we talked about versus what's built into Office 365. This isn't free, uh, but it is uh, streamlined. It's meant to be like a 10-user POC. Um, for a fixed cost. And so we're happy to chat with you about that and make sure that your users are having a good experience before you go roll it out to the rest of the organization. For those that are uh, attending today um, and or have attended in the past, we had a requirement that if you attended two out of our three, um, Enterprise Mobility, Windows 10, or today's Office 365, you were eligible for a drawing for an Xbox. So at the conclusion of that, probably later today, we will uh, put those eligible names in there. Unlike Mega Millions, where there were uh, lots and lots of people and lots and lots of numbers, we believe we'll probably only have about 15 people uh, that would be eligible for this. So we're looking forward to a random choice, and we will be notifying the winner for that Xbox um, probably later on today. Last mentions, uh, we have some upcoming events. Uh, get started with HR Portal this month in cybersecurity, uh, at the end of the month that we do every month. And we have an in-person event in December um, with HP over at a great steak joint known as Ditka's. Um, we blog several times per week. You'll notice uh, some blogs on the right are very specific to Office 365. So go to our blog page and just do a search for 365 and you'll see relevant hits like this uh, if you want to advance your learning. And with that, with any time remaining, I think we only have one or two minutes, but uh, for those that would like to ask questions, uh, Adam, you'll probably stop recording and uh, you guys are welcome to come off mute or simply 